Hey guys, welcome to the video where I share my favorite books from 2023. Now, I really struggled to narrow down my list this year, so I decided I'm not going to narrow it down. I'm not going to order like order it in any way. What we're going to do is we're going to separate all the books I read into different categories. This way, one, you'll get to see my favorite books of the year, but two, you'll also be able to see some different themes that I like in books, and I just thought this would be fun and something different. So I have, I think, nine different categories, each with at least two books in them. So there's quite a few books here. I originally was also going to share my favorite nonfiction books, but there's, it's going to take too long to do all of those. So I'm not sure if I will do that video at some point or if it will just go over on my Patreon. I haven't quite decided. I am going to be sharing a video with my worst and most disappointing books over on Patreon, so if you're interested in those kind of videos, you can watch that there shortly. So let's just get started with my first category, and that is Girls That Need to Save the Kingdom, because apparently that was a theme in four of the books that I read. That's, that's quite a bit. Um, so apparently it's something that I like. Now these, like I said, they're in no particular order. I can't decide. One of my favorites in this category is The Eternity Gate by Catherine Briggs. This is a, I think it's like a medieval fantasy where our main character, she is the handmaiden to the princess. She has to embark on a journey because she has the key to save the kingdom. So in this world there's something called the Eternity Gate which has been closed for many years. Seo is in charge of this key and this is the first book in I don't know how long the series is going to be but as soon as I finished it I was just annoyed because the book hadn't even quite come out yet. I got an ARC copy and then I have to wait even longer because I have to wait for book two. But I thoroughly enjoyed this. It was a different, I feel like it was kind of a bit of a different fantasy than I've read before, but thoroughly enjoyed it. Five stars for sure. Then we've got My Plain Jane, and this is a alternate history type story because we have Jane Eyre is one of our characters, but also so is Charlotte Bronte. But Jane can see dead people, and in this world, there's also a group of people, they're some kind of society, I forget the exact name, they catch ghosts that are disturbing people and they want Jane to join their society. So she starts out as a governess at Thornfield Hall, which is a nod to the place that Charlotte and her sisters went to school. It's not the most welcoming of places, it's very dark and dank kind of place I would say. So it's, it's definitely a, a very much a twist on Jane Eyre. There's a few things it was kind of cool to read going into it like knowing the story of Jane Eyre and seeing how the authors, this is by Cynthia Hand, Brody Ashton, and Jody Meadows, seeing how they were gonna take Jane Eyre but make it their own and out of this entire Lady Janie's series this one was my favorite. Then we have the final book in the Skyward series Defiant by Brandon Sanderson. So I can't say a whole lot about this because it's book four, but in book one we're introduced to Spensa and her, she is human, but they live on this planet that has been kind of attacked by these alien invaders for years. And Spensa's father was a pilot and he went down as a bit of a coward for some reason. Um, and died in a crash. And Spensa has kind of always lived in that shadow. Um, and so she wants to become a pilot to kind of redeem her family's name and also to save their kingdom. This everything is saving the world in some way or the other. And then the last book in this Girls That Have to Save a Kingdom is Kalur? Kalur? I forget how to pronounce it. It's not what you think. I feel like every time, but now I'm second guessing. Um, this one is a fantasy story that actually it has quite cold vibes. If you're looking for a winter read, this series, the first two books at least, um, are very cold feeling. So in this one, our main character, she is magical. So in this world, people with 
magic are called alters and she is what is called a mem and she can kind of like alter people's memories a little bit so she can't like take them away but for instance the head honcho of her area i forget what he is um he's obviously done a lot of bad things in his life and so he feels guilt from his memories and so she goes in on a regular basis and tries to like somehow like I don't know make the memories less painful but in doing so she takes some of that upon herself and no one either knows or really cares how much it affects her because she's a servant and she is a, a slave or a servant to this guy who owns kind of like a bar but instead of serving alcohol they serve memories and so you can buy memories to ease your suffering and right at the beginning of the book she gets an offer to kind of escape and so we follow her journey and so i think this is going to be a trilogy i've read the first two books i'm very curious to see how it ends uh, i'm very curious to see where it goes because i haven't expected the journey so far so much so i'm curious the next category is flawed characters that have major growth okay the first book with some major character growth is what katie did if you have heard me talk about this book the first half i would say Katie really annoyed me and then like something happens and there's some major growth in her life. So she starts out as a 12 year old that's just kind of obnoxious. She honestly reminds me of myself as a 12 year old but then things happen and she changes so much. It's a short little classic. I think this was written in I don't remember when 1872 yeah and it doesn't feel like it. I really enjoyed the writing. I did go on to read book two and didn't enjoy it as much so maybe book three um but if you want an easy to read classic that doesn't feel like a classic i would recommend this one another book with major character growth is he should have told the bees so technically i read this one at the very end of the year it didn't quite make it into my december or my like trimester three favorites because i filmed that video before but this is dual perspective we have two young ladies that have never met each other one lives on a farm and she really likes bees but she also has a lot of anxiety in regards to like leaving her farm and then the other one is works in the city and she has a like i, I can never think of how to describe it she makes like soaps and stuff and she has a shop that she's working on getting together and they are both named in trust after this man dies and they are very confused as to why they're both named um or like one of them makes sense but the other one doesn't so it's kind of like their journey to figure out why and then also um the growth that i see in this one is our character with anxiety like it's not like she just turns out perfectly at the end uh, but there is a lot of growth throughout the book and i really like to see that then another book i forgot to grab i Rika has a bunch in her room that I forgot. Um, the Outsiders. You guys, have I talked about this book enough in the last year? I don't, I don't think so. So we follow mostly Pony Boy. Um, he is part of a gang and oh man, I, I struggled to talk about this book because I didn't know anything going in and I think that's the best way to do it. Like I think you shouldn't know anything. Can you just trust me that there's a lot of character growth and the book is really good and you should read it? Because really that's all I want to say about it, but I really want you to read it. So hopefully that works. Okay, this next section, I don't have, have, have any of the books here. I own pretty much all the books in one series, but they're in Reika's room. And the other two I don't own. So I've got this title is Fun But Deep and Slightly Dark. So there's a few books in this one. So the entire Embassy Row series by Ali Carter that has All Fall Down, See How They Run, and Take the Key and Lock Her Up. All of those were five star books for me. In this one we follow Grace. At the age of 13 she saw her mother murdered. I think she's 16 now. And so like the past three years she spent time in the psych ward and like with psychologists like trying to figure out all her trauma. So the book is about her going to Embassy Row where her grandfather lives. He's an ambassador uh, for this fictitious country and she ends up seeing the guy that murdered her mother but everybody's telling her like it's not true it's not him he doesn't exist like all these different things and so she's questioning her own sanity 
it's definitely a case of an unreliable narrator but you know it which I like because I like unreliable narrators but so often you can't tell people if they're unreliable but even Grace like as the book is going she's like did I say that or did I just think that and like she it doesn't happen that much but she she even questions her own sanity a lot which just makes for an interesting read and the book two or book one and book two ended on such cliffhangers I would recommend having the entire series ready to go um yeah it was good okay then I have a wizard's guide to defense of baking so in this one we follow a 14 year old girl who is like a lesser wizard there are like bigger wizards that can do more than what she can do but she can do things with baking dough she can make like gingerbread men dance she can infuse dough make it not burn or get like day old bread not stale kind of things like it's it's pretty minor stuff um but at the beginning of the book she goes to the bakery and she sees a dead body and she finds out that this person is actually a lesser wizard and there's someone in her city killing lesser wizards so she has this like battle of she wants to figure out who's doing this but she also wants to stay safe herself and it's it's like a light and funny book and yet also really deep and dark hence why it's in this category um i thoroughly enjoyed it i cannot wait to get a physical copy because i want that on my shelves and this one might have been a little bit of a stretch to put in here well not really this is tress of the emerald sea so i read this one way at the beginning of the year this was one of sanderson's secret projects the first one that he released and i just loved it it's supposed to be kind of based off of or because of the princess bride which honestly is not a book or a movie that i like at all and i know i'm in the minority in that but like really don't like it but i loved tress so what happens is at the beginning of the book this boy that she loves is he goes off for some reason i think he's supposed to go find a wife i can't remember why he goes off but he goes off and he something happens to him he gets captured and she decides instead of just sitting at home she's gonna go out and search for him so she kind of joins this band of pirates and sanderson did some cool things like the sea is not water it's spores and yeah he just i felt like with this book and a lot of the other ones in the secret projects you could just tell he was having fun and and that made the reading so much fun so definitely re recommend checking that one out now we are on to cozy mysteries but not now these would be considered cozy mysteries i think but when i maybe it's like cozy mysteries but not punny when I think of cozy mysteries, often I have a certain cover and title in my brain. Like they're, they're usually pretty cheesy and I don't like those kinds of cozy mysteries, but I do like these kinds. So where's my book on my stack? The entire, from what I've read so far, the first three books in the Mrs. Polifax series is going on here. So I'm borrowing out book one to a friend so the book one is called The Unexpected Mrs. Polifax, then we've got The Amazing Mrs. Polifax, and then we have The Elusive Mrs. Polifax, which I don't own book three yet. They're all spectacular. I have book four on my books to read this next year because I'm enjoying the series. So also, once again, if you've been here for a while, you'll know that I've talked about the series a lot. Mrs. Polifax, around the age of 60-ish, she went to the doctor, was feeling mildly depressed. He says, isn't there anything you've ever wanted to do? And she says, yes, I've always wanted to be a spy. So she goes to the CIA and through a series of like different, unfortunate, not really supposed to happen events, she becomes one. And then for each book, we're following her on different cases or what are they called? Different missions. And she's a smart cookie. She's not just bumbling. And I have so thoroughly enjoyed the series and just plan on continuing until I'm done and then I want to reread them because they're so much fun. And then the other book that is on this in this section here is Vera what's it called? Vera Wong's Unsolicited Advice for Murderers. Yes. Oh, as soon as I saw this back on NetGalley forever ago, I loved the cover. I loved the title. I really like long titles. Um so Vera Wong, she is a funny old lady, honestly. Maybe it's just old ladies. This is my old ladies category. Yeah, that's what this is. Anyway, she owns a tea shop, but she named it Vera Wang's Tea Shop because she was trying to like get people in because of the Vera Wang name. 
Um, but she goes down one day and there's a dead body in her tea shop. And so she decides that she's not going to trust the police. I mean, like, the police are obviously made aware of it. But she's not going to trust them to solve it. She's going to solve it. And it's funny. It's really funny. I really like mysteries with old people. So, like, Mrs. Polifax and Vera Wong and Miss Marple, the Thursday Murder Club. The th those are my people. That's what I want to be doing when I'm older, is solving mysteries. Apparently I was really bad at grabbing books. So my next one I just titled Flowery Writing. And I have learned that in some cases I don't like flowery writing, but in some cases I really do. My throat is going to give out, so maybe what I'll do is I'll quickly go grab a drink. I'll make myself some hot cocoa, and then I'll grab the other book for this. Okay, I made it back. Hot cocoa has been acquired. I want to thank Charlene again for sending me this mug. Ever since I decluttered a bunch of mugs last week, this is like my main one. This is the one that has a bunch of first lines or first sentences from different books. Some of which I've read, some of which I haven't. It would be cool if they made a mug with like, for really good first sentences. Like, I, f I find their um, choices fascinating on here. But some of those first sentences of books are just like really gripping. Anyway, grabbed the book. Now my drink is too hot to drink, of course. Hopefully I don't spill it over all my books. Um, flowery writing. Okay, Amanda Dykes, Set the Stars Alight. I did go on to read another one of her books this year, the title of which I'm forgetting. And I loved this one a lot more. Um, this is a dual timeline. And so, does it say the years? I think it does. Um, oh yeah, but it skips around a lot. So 1805 and present day, but there's a little bit of lead up to each of those as well. I think those are the main timelines. So yeah, so present day, we're with a character named Lucy and she, I forget the title of what she is, but she's really fascinated by the story of this lost ship or lost ships in general. So she's kind of like an archaeologist of, that's the right word, of like things in the sea. And so she wants to get funding to go dig up this ship that she's heard of before. And then in the 1805 timeline, we're like following the ship. So because this is like really hard to explain, I'm just gonna give you a brief little bit here. It says, so like the Lucy stuff, um, but then 200 years earlier, three young lives are altered forever when a shepherd rescues the privileged son of a powerful admiral. As the children grow, war leads to unthinkable heartbreak, deep love, and a story of betrayal, sacrifice, and redemption that fades into obscurity as centuries pass. I should just read you a couple little snippets in here that I loved to demonstrate the flowery writing. So Lucy's father, uh, he was, uh, I think he was like dead right pretty much from the beginning of the story, uh, but he's like my favorite character because she often thinks back to the things that he said. Her father's familiar words gave chase in her heart. Don't you forget it, Lucy, my girl, the god of the stars. He is coming and coming and coming after you, always. The heart of a father who will never forget his daughter. Um, and that kind of like, that theme comes up a little bit throughout. This is in her author's note. He placed a pen in my hand, some words in my heart, and my hope is to use them to fight for the light, for the wonder, for the hope. That's just a little example of her writing. So far out of, I think I've read three of her books. This one is my favorite but I still own a couple more to read. So if you like flowery writing and a really good story, I would recommend this one. And then it should come as no surprise that Ellen Montgomery comes on as the other flowery writing. I really enjoyed Emily Klein's this year. I read a few of her books, at least three, possibly more, and this was by far my favorite. This is book two in the Emily Starr trilogy. And in this one, Emily is in high school and like she she knows she wants to be a writer um but her aunt will only send her to high school if she stops writing stories there was i think she was allowed to write things that were true and poetry but she wasn't allowed to write stories and it's interesting to see that like restriction placed on someone that really wants to write uh and i just i love ella montgomery's writing 
I can't even remember what was happening, but all of a sudden she's writing, it was not, of course, a proper thing to do. But then I have never pretended, nor will ever pretend, that Emily was a proper child. Books are not written about proper children. They would be so dull, nobody would read them. I love that paragraph so much. Um, yeah, lots, lots of things I loved. A lot of these books are very tabbed because I was loving so many different sections throughout them. So those are my two flowery writing books. I didn't realize how many books I had or how long this video was going to be. Oops. Okay, bookstores. Let's talk about books set in bookstores. So the first one that I read that was a favorite is Parnassus in we on Wheels. Parnassus on Wheels. So this is it was written in the early 1900s and it's about a bookstore in a covered wagon. I mean, that kind of sounds like a dream. So right at the beginning of the book, our main character, whose name I forget, oh, this is another book I need to find a physical copy of. She lives with her brother Andrew. I think they're about 40, both of them. And her brother is a writer. The last few years, he'll like all of a sudden take off for a long time and then end up writing a book about it. She's left to the farm. So she's a little bitter, okay? And then this man with this covered wagon comes onto the driveway onto the farm one day and tells her, it really bothers me that I can't remember her name, I think it's like Helen or something, tells her that he's come to ask Andrew to buy this bookstore because Andrew wrote these books and this guy likes his writing, he thinks this will be a good business opportunity for Andrew. And she is like, no, he is not leaving me on this farm to work. I will buy your bookstore from you. And she goes away with him that afternoon and she leaves a note, I think, maybe? Does she even tell Andrew where she's going? She just ups and leaves her brother while he's out in town or something and decides to <laughs> she's going to run this bookstore. So she uh, goes with this man for a little bit to like get the lay of how it's all run. And what a fun read and also like if I was, if this was a hundred years ago, like that would have been such a cool job. Um, it was so fun. The reason that I read that book was because I was told that if I was going to start on Shatona's series, the Book Strings series, that I should read that first because one of these books has a character, a cat named Parnassus. So her Book Strings series, the book two, like the official novel book two, I think is coming out right away. I don't know what the exact date is. Um, book one is called Twice Sold Tales, but there are two novellas that kind of come before it. And I don't know if uh, these do have an order, but I can't remember what they are now. Um, but we've got Spines and Leaves, Heart of Noel, and then Twice Sold Tales. So what happens is there's this man named Milton. He's used to getting businesses out of debt and like getting them back on their feet. And he just so happens to decide he's going to help some bookstores get off the ground, which like this series makes me want to start a bookstore so very much. Um, so he helps two bookstores in these two books. This one is a great winter read because it's set in a city or a town called Noel. So it's a lot of Christmas themes going on there. And then in Twice Sold Tales, our main character is Harper and she gets Milton to come help her with this bookstore that her aunt let, died and left to her. And oh man, it's so funny. Chatona's humor is hilarious. There is generally a romance and I often feel like I know where it's going, but then things get even deeper and I appreciate that. Uh, what I loved about this one is there's three main characters. And so each main character, their, pair, their chapters start in an applicable way. So Harper, hers all start with these like snarky book slogans or like shirt book shirt slogans so the first one is books because reality is overrated and then um, we have a main character named Noah who has just very quickly become a parent to a, like a seven-year-old and his chapters all start with like some kind of parenting advice let's see if I can find one parenting tip number 41 teach your kid that you'll stand up for him by standing up for other people or something and then when Milton comes in, his all start with a book recommendation. 
which is a dangerous. I definitely tagged a lot of his chapters. Oh yeah, like this is one I wanted to read. No Less Days by Amanda G. Stevens is a is perfect for combining a bit of fantasy in a contemporary setting and all wrapped up in a book that couldn't be a cozier autumnal read if you custom ordered it. Like that sounds perfect for fall. So I don't know. I like I love what Shatona has done with this series. Can't wait for the next book. Also just really would like to own a bookstore. I would like it to be financially possible. I would kind of also like it if someone else would be there every day because I would not want to deal with people all the time, but it's a nice idea. Now I had two favorites in the category of written in letters. That is something I really like when done well, obviously. First one is Daddy Long Legs. Once again, this is a classic that doesn't feel like a classic written in the early 1900s. Um, this is about a girl named Jerusha who goes by Judy. She has grown up in this orphanage, but she gets sponsored to go to college by someone that she calls Daddy Longlegs. The only requirement is that she must write a letter to him every month and then she, and she can't know who he is. But she did catch a glimpse of him coming out of like the head lady's office, but it was more just like shadows and he had long legs. So she calls him Daddy Longlegs. And so each chapter is just her like regaling him with stories of her time at college with these like funny little drawings interspersed and then trying to figure out what he looks like like trying to like get her get him to um describe if he has hair or uh, different things about himself like there's so many funny little illustrations really loved this book it really surprised me how much i loved it so more people need to read it because i need more people talking about it and then the other one was a surprise to me because it's Things We Didn't Say by Amy Lynn Green and I think I had read one of her books before this and hadn't really enjoyed it. So this one, our main character, her name is Joanna, jo Johanna. She starts out pretty harsh and is a bit of a, a bit of an unlikable character because she's, she's so blunt, um, but she warms up. So that was good because I wasn't liking her at the beginning. My first two tabs or so were orange, me not liking her character. Um, but what this is, right at the beginning, she writes a letter to her lawyer explaining that she's enclosing a bunch of letters from, I can't remember how long it spans, saying that these letters should clear up her name. Um, she has been accused of being, what, like helping POWs, I think? So she was at university, but she got asked, because she's a linguist, she got asked to come to work at this German POW camp, um, and she's supposed to, like, translate letters and things like that I think but things happen and she gets in trouble and she's trying to like redeem her name and so this is told in letters mostly from Johanna um, also to her and then a little bit of newspaper articles and possibly some other yeah a couple between other people it was really good there was there was there were so many things in here I loved definitely one of oh, I can't say top books but I really liked it one of, obviously one of my top books of the year. I don't know where it would fall if I had to rank all of these though. Okay, we are on to my second last section. This one has four books as well. This is Books That Made Me Cry, which I don't like knowing I'm gonna cry going into a book, but if an author can make me cry, like I feel like that demonstrates some really good writing. So I'm actually surprised, did I read this book this year? I must have read it at the beginning of the year. Stories That Bind Us. Now, this one I did struggle to get into because it's set in the 1960s and I felt like they made our main character out to be really, really old. But it's just because of the stuff that she's wearing. So she's, I think she's 40. Our main character becomes a widow right at the beginning of the book. But she sounds more like 80. But I think it has to do with the things that she's wearing. Like the things a 40 year old wore in the 60s are like things that an 80 year old wears now, if that makes sense. Uh, well, not even all 80 year olds, honestly, but some. Um, so I just had that like struggle mentally of being like, hey, how old is she? And I've found over the years that I really need to be able to visualize my characters or else I can't get into a book. So once I got her down in my head, then it worked. So her husband died and him and his family have always owned a bakery. And, and then also at the beginning of the book, her main character's sister comes into town with a five-year-old son that our main character didn't know existed and the sister has some major issues. 
So uh, her main character's name is Betty. She ends up being the main caregiver for this five-year-old for a lot of the book and it's it's heartbreaking but so well done. Susie Finkbeiner does that to me all the time. This one was a patron recommendation. I read the library copy and then I had to buy the book. This is Soldier Boy. Oh, this book will break you. This is the true story of Ricky Eniwar, abducted in 1989 at age 14 to fight in the Ugandan Civil War. So this whole book is about his time as a child soldier, other people's times as child soldiers, but then it also does have like a redemption arc, but it is violent. Like it is, it is true, but there's a lot of talk in here about um, the violence to children, from children, uh, like it's, it's so heavy, but also like that, that's, these stories need to be told. So very well done, very well done, but heartbreaking. Whew, that's, that's a heavy one. Another one I knew I was gonna cry going in because everyone else was talking about it is The Extraordinary Deaths of Mrs. Kip. Um, this one, our main character, Mrs. Kip, well, one of the main characters, she is going to hospice care and she, I like, she, I just want to be her. She finds the like most curmudgeon -y person in this building with her and decides to pray for that person, be that person's friend, hold their hand, like it's amazing. Um, but there's another character, Aiden, who is a journalist, I think. Um, and she, Aiden is given the task to write Mrs. Kipp's obituary before Mrs. Kipp has died and she ends up unraveling a lot of Mrs. Kipp's past and yeah this book is oh it's so sad you like you know when your main character is in hospice care you're gonna you're gonna be dealing with some grief but it was so good yeah I want to be Mrs. Kipp definitely recommend and the last one was The Lost Year this was an audiobook that we listened to in our homeschool um, we have multiple main characters. So we have Matthew set right during COVID. He lives with his mom and his great grandmother. Um, and he is struggling because his mom won't really let him do anything because his grand great grandmother is old. They don't want to get her sick. But Matthew ends up unraveling a little bit of his great grandmother's story. She was like a tween during the Ukrainian famine. And so we follow his grandmother and two of her cousins as well. So we, we have four points of view. Oh, and it's like, it's laugh out loud funny. Like Matthew, he he's really into Zelda and like he's got funny moments. And then like the next chapter, you're like trying not to cry. Um, it's so good. It's so hard. I feel like it hasn't been talked about enough on booktube. I feel like more people need to be reading this. Um, and it's, it's a good point in history to be learning about. Like, I don't think, I haven't read or heard much about the Ukrainian famine. Like, I knew it existed and stuff, but this really opened my eyes. to Definitely recommend it. And, it, and, and the laughter balances out the crying a little bit. Last section is gothic vibes, because I learned this year that I really like that. And so the first one is going to be a Jamie Jo Wright. This is a Vanishing at Castle Moreau. And the reason this one has gothic vibes is because, like her books are, the, it's dual timeline. So first timeline is 1870, and our main character is a servant. She takes a position as a housemaid at Castle Moreau um, to escape, uh, how would it describe it? The horrors of her past life. Okay, but what happens is she ends up working for this authoress. It says, a reclusive and eccentric gothic authoress who hides tales more harrowing than the ones in her novels. So gothic vibes there for sure. And then present day, our main character's name is Cleo. She is hired by the grandson of the woman who lives at Castle Moreau. And um, the, the grandmother is a hoarder. And so Cleo has been tasked with like decluttering this place. And then of course she kind of starts unraveling some of the story of Castle Moreau and our timelines will connect somehow. Um, I always find it fascinating to see how she does that. Yeah, 
really enjoyed this one. And then I have My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier. I was excited to love another one of her books this year. Um, I think Rebecca still holds the top spot in my heart, but I really did enjoy My Cousin Rachel. Knowing going in what a gothic story was and like what I was getting here. Um, so in this one, our main character, oh, there's nothing on the back. So our main character, what is he? He his, He's in his 20s. He lives with his cousin and he's going to inherit his cousin's land when his cousin dies. His cousin decides to go to Italy, suddenly gets married to Rachel, and then he dies very suddenly in Italy. And our main character is a little suspicious, so he goes out to Italy to try to like figure things out, comes back, and then Rachel shows up at his place. And he's very suspicious of what went down in Italy. He's trying to figure things out and things happen. I don't know. It's like, it's not a perfect novel, but I love that Daphne du Maurier can have those like gothic vibes, like eerie. You know there's something more going on here, but you don't know what it is. I love it when authors can do that. And the last book, I'm filming this and it's like minus, um, what was it outside? Minus 40 something Celsius, which is like 40 is the same in Celsius and Fahrenheit minus, minus 40 both ways. Um, I think it felt like minus 51 last I saw, which was minus 60 Fahrenheit. And I'm going to share a summer book, The Lake House. Um, so this is Kate Morton, also dual timeline-ish. There's, there's kind of a few different timelines going on. Um, very much set in summer, so if you want to escape the cold, you could read a book like this, but it has gothic vibes. So in 1933, an 11 month old boy went missing. We are mostly with his older sister. I can't remember how old she was during that time, um, around that time period. And then we are 70 years later, our main character is Alice. She's a detective. Oh, not Alice. Um, Sadie is a detective. And Sadie, something sketchy went on with her detective side of things, <laughs> her work side of things. So she's on break and she ends up going out to the place where this disappearance occurred. Um, Cause that's where her, who did she go to hang out with? Her aunt, her mom, I don't know. She goes out there. And she starts kind of uncovering some of the story of what went down at this house. And yeah, this is my absolute Kate, absolute favorite Kate Morton story. Normally I say her books feel like they're about a hundred pages too long. This was not one of them. This one, I was, I was there for every page and really enjoyed it. So I know this is a long video. I did not expect it to be so long. Um, those are my favorites from the year, assuming I didn't forget any. I don't think I did. I would love to hear your favorite books. I am going to be doing a video very soon, probably next week, sharing your favorite books that you guys um, commented on my community tab. And if you guys are interested in hearing my worst and most disappointing books, because there was a few, um, that will be over on my Patreon in my Windy Poplars tier. Should be up pretty soon. So thanks for hanging out with me today, guys. <laughs>